Islamic terrorists don't need an excuse to attack the United States. They don't attack us for what they do. They attack us for who we are. In my opinion, the only problem with Guantanamo Bay is there are too many empty beds and cells there right now. We should be sending more terrorists there for further interrogation to keep this country safe. As far as I'm concerned, every last one of them can rot in hell. But as long as they don't do that, then they can rot in Guantanamo Bay. When Americans were fighting for their lives in Benghazi, Barack Obama did neither. He sent no quick reaction force, and he didn't even stay in the Situation Room to supervise the execution of his orders. We expect more from lieutenants in the Army than our President gave us that night. Four Americans lost their lives that night in Benghazi. They deserve justice. The American people deserve the truth. One other lesson I learned in the Army is we leave no man behind, and we will not leave these four men behind. Ladies and gentlemen, the Senator from Arkansas, Tom Cotton. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thanks very much for that warm welcome. I'm not sure I can beat that. Maybe we should just break for lunch now. Say, uh, it's great, great pleasure to be here with you today. I was, I was a little worried I might not make it this morning. Uh, I flew in and uh, our plane waited for a long time on the tarmac. Uh, we were waiting so long I thought Bill Clinton might be boarding my plane to come talk to me. <laughs> but <laughs> but then I, I realized I'm a mere United States Senator. I'm not the Attorney General who decide whether to indict his wife or not. At, Actually, actually, I should have known better. I should have known that Bill Clinton wouldn't be there. Uh, I think he had to race home uh, to New York uh, and keep the home fires burning as a dutiful spouse while his wife had to go testify to the FBI today. It's, uh, wow, what a, what, a remarkable, what a remarkable presidential year it's been. I mean, uh, truly remarkable. I mean, the Democrats had a choice between two socialists, and they chose the one under FBI investigation. Now this, you know, this last week, uh, today, with Hillary testifying yet again in front of the FBI, and Bill Clinton meeting with the Attorney General uh, secretly in Phoenix, is a reminder of the kind of casual, carefree, ethics-free zone that comes with the Clintons everywhere they go and should be a reminder to the American people of the kind of endless ethics controversies and scandals that we'll have in store for us if we choose Hillary Clinton as our next president. I mean, just think about it. Bill Clinton having a secret meeting with the Attorney General when his spouse is the target of an FBI investigation. And when he himself is the target of an FBI investigation into the Clinton Foundation. Of course, this all goes back to Hillary Clinton's decision not to use secure government communications, but rather create her own unsecure server in the bathroom of her house to conduct official government business to include highly classified information. Now, she's turned over a lot of emails, but there's still over 30,000 emails that we don't know the contents of. The FBI still hasn't been able to access them. In fact, it's gotten so bad, I think the FBI may be on the verge, on the verge of asking Vladimir Putin if he'll turn over his copies of those emails. Now, but uh, seriously though, seriously. <laughs> now Hit Hillary's reckless and, and, and even criminal disregard for our nation's secrecy laws and the sensitive handling, handling of classified information, in my opinion, disqualifies her from being our commander in chief. It, it also compromises her. It also compromises her because we do have to wonder what Vladimir Putin or leaders in places like China and Iran and North Korea know about the email traffic that went across that unsecure server from her and all those people who might populate her White House. But she's also the architect of Barack Obama's disastrous foreign policy. Now we'll return to Hillary Clinton in just a little bit, but for the moment let's consider the consequences of that foreign policy. I sit on the Intelligence Committee. 
So over the last 18 months uh, on that committee in the Senate, I've learned a lot of things about what's going on in the world. It may look bad, I know. But I can tell you, it is not as bad as it looks. It is much worse. Unfortunately, I, I'm not joking. The world has grown gravely more dangerous over the last seven and a half years. The United States is no longer seen around the world as the leader of the free world, which no one would have ever disputed under President Reagan or both President Bush's. Why don't you let me tell you a little personal story about how unsafe and threatened many normal Americans feel. Now, as you may know, I served about five years in the Army. I was in law school when the 9-11 attacks happened. I got out of school and paid off my loans after a couple years and then went to enlist. Now, I, I told the recruiter, I said, I want to go, I want to be an infantry officer, I want to be an airborne ranger, I want to go to Iraq. He said, hold on, sir, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I, I'm a lawyer, I admitted it. Probably because I, you know, I was dressed like this and not many people go into recruiting stations dressed like this across America. And he said, you know, I could make you a JAG attorney. You could, uh, you know, have much less training time, you know, 10, 12 weeks. You have more rank, therefore more pay. If you want to go overseas, you'll be overseas faster. And I said, no, no, infantry, airborne ranger, Iraq, Afghanistan. He said, you're not a very good lawyer, are you, sir? <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, the lawyers I worked with agreed with that, I think. Um, but, but he signed me up, and I had to break the news to my folks. My dad was a Vietnam veteran. My mother was married to him when he was in Vietnam. Uh, and it wasn't a happy time in the Cotton household, I'll say that much. Not least of which they wanted to know why I spent all that money to go to law school if I was just going to join the Army afterwards. But they, my dad knew what it was like to be on the front lines in combat. My mother knew what it was like to have a loved one overseas. And I tried to explain to my, my parents that I, I was doing this because of the way they raised me. They raised me to be a patriot, to love my country, and my country was attacked. I wanted to go defend it. I, that wasn't persuasive to them, though. I said, the rhetorical question, how can, it be, how can it be a mistake to serve your country in uniform in a time of war? My dad didn't have an answer to that rhetorical question, so he normally stormed off and huffed. I tried to be practical. I said, look, they attacked us on 9-11 at the Pentagon and the World Trade Centers. What makes you think we might not be next? We live just a few miles from a nuclear power plant. What makes you think that Islamic terrorists won't attack us there next? And my father said, son, you need to lighten up. <laughs> just last year, my father got a concealed carry permit for the first time in his life. A 70-year-old man, 70-year-old man got a concealed carry permit. And I said, dad, why'd you, why'd you get a concealed carry permit? And he said, someone has to defend us if ISIS comes over here to cut our heads off. That's the sad reality. That's how fearful many Americans are, not just in big cities, but in small little farm towns like where I live. And the world is more dangerous today because Barack Obama's foreign policy is impotent. We've seen radical cuts to our military over the last seven and a half years. Why? Because military strength is seen not to deter our enemies, but is seen as a cause for military adventurism. Strength and confidence in defense of our interests and our allies and our liberty is seen not to deter aggression, but rather to provoke aggression. Just think about some of our worst enemies, those very Islamic terrorists, the one who attacked us on 9-11. In his re-election campaign, Barack Obama says they are on the run. Maybe that's so if he meant they are running wild all around the globe. When he withdrew from Iraq in 2011 against the advice of his commanders, after Hillary Clinton couldn't secure an agreement with the Iraqi government to keep a small contingent of forces there, they let al-Qaeda in Iraq up off the mat and gave it the time and space it needed to turn itself into what we now call the Islamic State. The Islamic State is not the JV team and it is not contained, as Barack Obama would say. It is chopping the heads off of Christians. It is executing Americans. It is enslaving small girls and women. And now, with increasing regularity and apparent impunity, it is striking in the heart of major Western cities 
from Istanbul to Paris to Brussels to Orlando and San Bernardino and many other places all around the globe. What's Barack Obama's response? He says we all watch too much cable TV and get ginned up about the threat of terrorism. He has a PR problem. Folks, if a politician tells you he has a communications problem, he has a reality problem. And the reality is, <laughs> the reality is that Barack Obama has consistently been too timid and too slow in the fight against the Islamic State and radical Islamic terrorism. He thinks that, that, the, he, that the threat of overreaction to terrorism may be greater than the threat of terrorism itself. That's why he sat through a baseball game with the Cuban dictator and did the wave in the middle of the Brussels attacks. After the Orlando attacks, he didn't say what we're going to do to combat ISIS. He tried to take away more guns that lawful, law-abiding American citizens owned. He treats terrorists like common criminals. I, for one, don't think terrorists should ever hear the words, you have the right to remain silent. Maybe, maybe the first words they hear is, welcome to Guantanamo Bay Detention Center. <laughs> yet, yet what, what does Barack Obama do? He wants to close Guantanamo Bay. He wants to bring those hardened terrorists here, right here to Colorado. Well, as you saw me say on that video, I will reaffirm again today, as far as I'm concerned, they can all rot in hell. But until they do, they can rot in Guantanamo Bay. And of course, we can't, we can't talk about the threat of radical Islam unless we talk about Iran as well. The Islamic State is a grave danger, but until they control territory that's two and a half times the size of Texas, and 80 million people, and an economy of over $400 billion, and have a major modern military, and a vast nuclear infrastructure, then the Islamic Republic of Iran will be a greater long-term threat than the Islamic State is. Now, my objections to the nuclear deal with Iran are well known. I won't rehearse them all here for you today. I will simply say this. Whether Iran breaks that deal, which they have a habit of doing in their international obligations, or whether they keep that deal, they will be on the path to nuclear weapons in barely 10 to 15 years, the blink of an eye among nations. And you cannot divorce that deal either from their malign conduct throughout the Middle East. They remain, our, in John Kerry's own State Department's words, the number one state sponsor of terrorism in the world. They continue their reign of terror throughout the Middle East, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen, on Israel's borders. They continue to support vicious terrorist groups like Hezbollah and Hamas. Earlier this year, they broke into another embassy and torched the place, which is apparently their go-to move when they're disappointed in another nation's conduct something far beyond the bounds of the entire civilized world. They continue to hold Americans hostage to this day. They kidnapped 10 of our sailors earlier this year and committed war crimes by parading them around on TV. They launched missiles in violation of Security Council resolutions, missile, miss, missiles that are inscribed with the words, Israel must be wiped out. And what does the president do? He treats them like a normal, respectable nation. He recently said Iran should be allowed to share the Middle East, to share the Middle East. A radical terror sponsoring country should be allowed to share one of the most vital regions in the world. He refuses to punish them for those missile tests. He gave them $1.7 billion in ransom to get some of the hostages back. He now proposes to use your tax dollars to subsidize their nuclear program. And he has John Kerry running around the world, acting as if he's the president of the Iran Chamber of Commerce. That's not the way you deal with these radical theocrats who have been a mortal enemy for the United States for 37 years, who still chant on most Fridays, death to America and death to Israel. You stand up to them and you draw a line and you say very simply, you have a binary choice. Either you eliminate your nuclear program or we will. Because time is not on our side. Time is not on our side. 10 to 15 years may seem like a long time for some of us. But if you want to see Iran's future, look to North Korea's present. In 1994, we signed a similar deal with North Korea. And in just 12 years, they conducted their first nuclear test. Now, by some estimates, they have dozens of nuclear warheads, and they continue 
to test missiles that are capable of striking U.S. citizens, U.S. troops, and U.S. territory. That's what the future holds for Iran if we don't make a change in course. Now, these are just the worst of the threats. I've said nothing about China or Russia. I've said nothing about Barack Obama's shabby and disrespectful treatment for our allies around the world. To include Great Britain, whom he threatened if they had the audacity to leave the Uni European Union, a country that is one of the world's oldest democracies, Barack Obama had the temerity to go to their country and threaten them for exercising their sovereign right of self-government. Well, what drives this? This strange combination of weakness and arrogance, of appeasement and dismissiveness. I would submit to you that it's a lack of confidence in the American experiment, a lack of confidence in American exceptionalism. Now, Barack Obama says that he believes in American exceptionalism, just like the Brits believe in British exceptionalism and just like the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. Well, what that really means, though, is that no nation is exceptional. That the belief in American exceptionalism is just some outmoded idea, a chauvinist prejudice for one's own land, something best got over by reasonable and intelligent adults. And in this light, the Obama-Clinton foreign policy begins to make more sense. Our so-called enemies are simply expressing legitimate historical grievances for past American wrongdoing. Our allies, rather than being a way to spread the risks and share the costs of preserving the peace, are seen as free riders who are more likely to get us in trouble than keep us out of it. Time to come home, America. Time to nation build here at home. Realize that we're just one more country with no special place in the story of mankind. To borrow a phrase from Hillary Clinton, it's time to lead from behind. Well, I say that we conservatives should beg to differ. We still have the old faith of our fathers. We still believe that America is a special place. We still believe in American exceptionalism, and we believe in strength and confidence in the defense of our liberty in the preservation of our safety, and in the pursuit of our interests. We believe, to paraphrase Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., if there's nothing worth fighting and dying for, then there is nothing worth living for. And why do we believe these things? We believe them because America is special. America is more than a place. America is an idea, an idea founded on the natural equality of all mankind that we are created equal in the eyes of our Lord, man or woman, young or old, black or white, that we all have inalienable rights, life, liberty, property, the right to keep what we earn to the sweat of our brow, something that no government, no democratic majority can take away. We believe that the government exists to serve us, the people, not the other way around. And these, these ideas are what make America exceptional. It's why we are blessed by providence to lead the world, to be, as Abraham Lincoln said, the last best hope on earth. And that hope rests not just here with you, not just in this country, but around the world. As I travel the world and meet with leaders, as they come to Washington, I meet with them there, whether it's from Scandinavia, the Malaysian Peninsula, or the Korean Peninsula, to Saudi Arabia. The world is crying out for more American leadership, for an America that is once again strong and confident and believes in the blessed role that we have played throughout our history. We owe it to the people who bequeathed this country to us and to our children and our grandchildren to take up that mantle of leadership once again. We may have some problems in this country, but where would you rather your child or grandchild be born than the United States of America? And as, I, and as I said, I'll now return to Hillary Clinton when we think about the future of American leadership. I want to impress upon you the stakes of this election. Of all the people, 
who deserve a commander in chief, who believe in American exceptionalism, who believe in leading from the front, not leading from behind. Our troops deserve such a commander in chief. <laughs> Hillary Clinton likes to portray herself as ready for that role, ready to lead those men and women who wear our country's uniform. She presents herself as a steady, experienced, capable hand, ready to be commander in chief on day one, ready to take the 3 a.m. phone call. Ladies and gentlemen, Hillary Clinton had her 3 a.m. phone call. It was called Benghazi. She slept through it and four Americans died. And, and we now know, we now know with the release this week of the Special Committee on Benghazi's report, she barely even list, lifted a finger to try to reinforce them at Benghazi. Ladies and gentlemen, Hillary Clinton is disqualified from being our commander in chief. Our troops deserve better. They deserve someone who will fight for them and who will fight for this country. I know this is a patriotic crowd and Colorado is a patriotic place. I'm sure we have a lot of veterans in this audience today. We may even have, give them all a round of applause. I'm also sure we have some Blue Star families, moms and dads, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters whose child or parent is currently serving overseas, maybe in Iraq, maybe in Afghanistan, maybe in places that most people don't know about. And we probably even have some Gold Star families as well. Families who lost a loved one in combat, maybe a grandfather in World War II, maybe a dad in Vietnam, maybe a sister, the war on terror, maybe a son or daughter in the war on terror. We owe them all a debt that we cannot repay. But the last thing we can do, at least one thing that we can do is give them a commander in chief who will honor their sacrifice and service. And I'll leave you I'll leave you with two stories, two stories about those fallen heroes to frame that choice that we face. One is a story about a unit called the Old Guard at Arlington National Cemetery, a unit where I served between my deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. If you've been to Arlington, you know they guard the Tomb of the Unknown, they perform funerals in the cemetery, they perform ceremonies around the capital region. In those days, unfortunately, they also performed something called the Dignified Transfer of Remains at Dover Air Force Base, the repatriation ceremony for soldiers who had fallen in Iraq or Afghanistan. As a junior officer, my job was to be the officer in charge. I'd take a casket team and a general as the distinguished visitor on a Black Hawk up to Dover Air Force Base. And I'd be the first person onto the aircraft coming in from Europe. I'd inspect the caskets. If the flags on those caskets were damaged, I'd replace them. We'd move the casket down onto the vertical loader. It'd be lowered, and then the casket team would perform the ceremony, usually in the middle of the night, given the distances and time zones from the theater, often cold and windy or hot. And despite those conditions, despite the hardship of the moment, those soldiers performed that mission with the highest degree of care, attention to detail, professionalism, and yes, love. Second story, a similar ceremony at Andrews Air Force Base, two days after the attacks in Benghazi. The four Americans killed there were returned to Andrews. The President, the Secretary of State, all the senior dignitaries of our government were there. And Hillary Clinton, who we now know, thanks to those secret emails, knew the truth, that this was a pre-planned, deliberate terrorist attack, something she had shared with her own daughter and the Prime Minister of Egypt, looked in the faces of the families of those four fallen Americans and lied to them and told them it was the result of a videotape and they were gonna get the guy who made that tape. 
who do you want as your next commander-in-chief? A person who honors the patriotism and the service of those young soldiers at Dover Air Force Base? Or a person who will lie to the faces of the families of America's fallen heroes for political gain? And maybe more important, what kind of commander-in-chief will best honor the sacrifices of those fallen heroes at Dover Air Force Base and Andrews Air Force Base? Thank you. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America.